You will notice that we are getting close to the end of the syllabus, and uh, you have been a great class, beautiful class, a very large class, and we appreciate it. We're glad that you're so eager to drink in the truth of God and make it a part of your total spiritual being, and that upon the branches of your spiritual lives there shall flourish the fruit of the Spirit and of the power of the living God. We're just happy to teach to you these great truths. And we appreciate your attentiveness. Uh, we appreciate your great desire to learn and to know. I appreciate sharing with you uh, 50 years in this type of ministry and, and uh, having fellowship with men uh, like Smith Wigglesworth, not over a period of days, but a period of years, and being with him in his home and in conventions and places of this nature and, and understanding him. And of, of meeting uh, men like Stephen Jeffries, who possibly had more miracles than anybody that's lived in, in our times at all. And, and so I, I'm, I'm happy that I can share with you things that we have seen, and then you can share with your children uh, things that you've seen. You can say, I knew a long time ago an old man named Lester Sumrall. <laughs> Don't you do it. <laughs> our, our lesson says, uh, what do you do when a Christian gets sick? That's like saying, what do you do when your car won't run, you know? When the battery won't work, what you gonna do? In Hebrews 4 and 15, it says, we have an high priest. We, we do not have a high priest which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities. Now, I, I would put a line under feeling of our infirmities. Uh, as I've told you before, the devil has no feeling for any human being because he has never been a human being. Any more than you have any feeling for an ant bed if you were to take your foot and, and take an ant bed and, and mess it all up and push the ants far down into the earth. You have, no, you have no understanding of what the ants are calling you. It might be bad. You have no idea how they feel about it. But if you just watch, they start putting their house back together real quick. So they're very industrious. That's the reason the Bible says, go to the ant, uh, thou sluggard. And, and so uh, there's, something, there's something to learn there. Uh, but the Lord has an understanding of your infirmities. He was a person. He was a man. Had two eyes just like yours. He got, he, he got sand in his eye just like you have and had to get it out. And, and uh, he got pushed around just like you've been pushed around. Uh, he, he had to sleep in the open because he didn't have a bed at times. He, he went hungry and ate green corn in a field. And so he has gone through life, you know, the same way you went through life, with, with the same kind of nervous system you got. Yeah. And yet uh, he became the one that was perfection personified. And, and he is our guide and our leader besides our Lord and our Savior. If you're glad for it, say amen. amen. Now, now there are Christians who will add guilt to sickness. Uh, when a Christian gets sick, what do you do? They feel that they have failed God some way for sure, or they wouldn't have gotten sick. And I've told you the story before that in, in my church in Hong Kong, I, I had one of our personal workers that had been out working hard for the Lord all day to fall down uh, stone steps into the ocean. We were standing on the dock, and we had just completed our handing out 50,000 uh, pieces of Christian literature up in those vast apartments and we gotten ourselves together to get in our cars and, and, and go home. And this woman stepped backwards and, and when she did, she fell into the sea and went down stone steps, about 20 stone steps. I thought she was dead. I, I jumped down there and picked her up out of the water and brought her back up those steps in my arms. We, we, we called for the, uh, for the ambulance and they rushed her to a hospital which was about five minutes away uh, from that area. And uh, fortunately, uh, it was only uh, uh, an ankle that was hurt. But three of my good members marched into that hospital the next day and say, come on, what have you done? She said, nothing. Nobody would fall down steps if they weren't full of the devil. What have you done? <laughs> Confess it out. So the next time I went to the hospital, I had her crying about three of my members. So I had to call the other three members in. I said, now, wait a minute. We got a big bad devil that pushes people down steps, you know? You don't have to be bad. I said, Job wasn't bad. If he had been bad, he wouldn't have had all of his troubles. It was because he was so everlastingly good, it made the devil mad. 
And, and, and so I, I said, it, it, you, you just can't say that and it is not true that when you get ill or you get sick or you get hurt, that it, it proves at that point uh, that you have done something wrong. That is not, is not true. So uh, we deal with Romans 8 and 1. That's your first point. Do not come under the condemnation uh, if you become ill. And it's, it's, it's difficult. And then I, I'm, you know, immediately you want to search your life. What have I done wrong? I'm sick. There's therefore now, say now, now. no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We are not a condemned people. The Lord Jesus has taken away all condemnation. There is no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We are not a condemned people. We don't walk around with a, heavy, with a heavy cloud hanging over our lives saying, what have I done now? Oh, I must have done wrong. This wouldn't happen. That is not true. Remember some beautiful Bible Christians were attacked by sickness. Epaphroditus in Ephesians 2, 27, he says, for he, indeed he was sickened to death. You see, that's pretty sick. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have had sorrow above measure. And so he was, so he was healed. And then you find Trophimus in 2 Peter, 2 Timothy 4, 20. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletus sick. Sick. And uh, he wouldn't have left him sick if he'd have gotten him healed. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just when you think you can heal everybody, it's when the Lord lets you down. Hey, really down. To let you know that you're not the healer. He is the healer. Amen. He is the healer. And, and, uh, and James... Uh, uh, and in chapter 5 and verse 14, the great apostle says, uh, is any sick among you? He's talking about the church. Is any sick among you? Don't let him condemn himself. <laughs> he said, call for the elders of the church in the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord will raise him up, you see? And he says, if he committed into sin, it shall be forgiven him. So he put the whole thing in there. I believe, that's his in point two, that God desires and wishes to heal any and every person who finds himself sick for whatever reason. Often I have been asked, is it always God's will to heal? And my answer to that question must be from the Word of God, you know, as a source, otherwise it's not on the right foundation. The Bible teaches me and you and all that the church today is the Israel of God. In Israel, the Old Testament, as long as God's people were in the wilderness living under the cloud of God's presence, there was not one weak or sick one among them. Put a circle around Psalm 105, 37. That's what it says. There was not one. You can keep three million people well, you're not doing bad, you know. God specifically promised that he would not allow any of the diseases of Egypt to come upon those chosen people. Exodus 15, 26. The only time that God's children found themselves in jeopardy was when they were rebellious against their heavenly father. So it is possible to be sick because of rebellion in one's heart. Not always. In the New Testament, Jesus never refused any person healing. Now, I'd like for you to pause there for a moment. He healed thousands, maybe tens of thousands. Jesus never refused a single person, no one, never, to be healed. If it were God's will for people to be sick, it seems that somewhere along the line, Jesus would have said, well, honey, I can't heal you. It's the Father's will for you to be that way. Do you know what he said? He says, Satan has bound you, and I'm setting you free. Get out of there. Hallelujah. <laughs> that, was, that was the way to do it, wasn't it? Yeah. What if Jesus had said, now, I can't heal you, honey. You're supposed to be sick. Man, I'm glad that's not in the record book, aren't you? Amen. Yeah. Of all the times, of all the tens of thousands of people dealt with, not one time did you hear Jesus saying anything like that. To me, this is one of the greatest truths of the whole Bible right there. Not one time did Jesus say no to a person that was sick in their bodies. Not one time. The promise, by his stripes, ye were healed, is all inclusive. The provision was made for everyone, for any and every disease. In, 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 in giving the great commission to his disciples, Jesus said in Mark 18, you should take up serpents. If you drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt you. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And they shall recover. You say, well, what can I do if I'm a Christian and I get sick? On your point three there, the first thing I would do is take the promises of God and I would speak them out loud. I would speak them out loud. 
health and healing is promised in the atonement. I would accept that and I would declare it and say health and healing belongs to me because of the atonement. I would quote verses like Psalm 103 and 3, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. <laughs> That's great enough for you, isn't it? Yeah, if he has forgiven all your iniquities, then he has healed all your diseases. The same all is in the same sentence, you see. Or only, or only, only just two or three words apart there. In Isaiah 53 and 5, that all of us know, the Lord Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Not maybe, not hope so, not some, are healed. And the scripture we just quoted you from 1 Peter 2, 24, who, has, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Notice how healing and sin have the same uh, remedial powers, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we being dead to sin should not live under, should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. You know, put them right together. So anybody trying to separate them says, well, you can be saved, but you can't be healed. Better read the word again. Going to have to have some deletions here. Health and healing is promised to those who obey God. Health and healing are promised to those who obey God. Proverbs 3 and 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from, heal from evil. And look at verse 8. It shall be health to thy navel, thy inner parts. And it shall be as marrow to thy bones. It's where your life, your life flow is in those, that marrow within your bones. So that's very strongly stated that if we trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not into our own understanding, be not wise in our own eyes, and depart from evil, then we've got it made. That's what it says here. It shall be health to you. If you believe it, say amen. amen. And we read in number two there in Proverbs 4 and 20. My son, attend, attend to my words. Incline, incline thine ear to my sayings. His words, his sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, but keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are life unto those that find them. And health to all their flesh. <laughs> their life and health. It says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Whatever you're saying is what you're getting. If you're going to talk sickness, you're going to get it. Amen. Same with poverty. If you're going to talk poverty, the devil says, yeah, I got a lot of that. And he's getting poor all the time. If he gets to hell, he's going to be nothing but a dirty beggar down there. Not a thing. So don't follow him or you're going toward poverty. And if you follow Jesus, you're headed toward riches. Glory be to God. You're going to get a mansion made of diamonds and pearls and gold. Say, so it's not bad. In Exodus 15, 26, God says, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to do that which is right in his sight, I'll, and will give ear to his commandments. You see what he says now? Hear the voice of the Lord, obey his commandments, and to keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah Rapha. God gave himself a name on the face of the earth that we still have today. The Jehovah Rapha. That's his name is God. In Exodus 23 and 25, ye shall serve the Lord God. You know, put a little line on the word serve. We're talking about how, how you get your healing, how you keep your healing. If you shall serve the Lord God and, and shall bless thy, he shall bless thy bread and thy water and will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Hey, I like that, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I just underscore that last little line there. I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. That's, that's, the, that's the conditions that we live under. Healing is promised to those who have faith also. James 5, 14, in the sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church, pray over them, anointing them with oil in the, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, the prayer of faith, which is the next verse, the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Uh, we have already read to you from the words of the Lord Jesus in the Great Commission, Mark chapter 16, verse 18 says, And they shall take up serpents, if they drink any dead thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. There are many ways to pray for people, as we've shown you. Not one way. Laying on of hands is just one of the ways that you can see people healed by the power of God. Now, in Deuteronomy 7 and 15, it says, The Lord will take away from thee all sickness. Would you mind putting a little circle around the word all? I don't mind that little word, do you? 
and will put none of the diseases of Egypt, uh, which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. Whew. Who gets sick? People don't like you. I'm just reading from the Bible is all. God's promise to take away sickness. God wishes to, to give you health above all else. And in, in 3 John 2 above, beloved, I wish above all things. I'd put a little circle around all things. I wish above all things you, you may prosper. That's financially. Be in health. That's good health. As your soul prosper. And just, just full of the Holy Ghost and the power of God and the love of Jesus. We read in 2 Corinthians 12, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength, my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength, God's strength, God's power is made perfect in weakness, that when he comes down and gives strength unto those that are weak and those that are feeling, you know, they don't have any life for them, he says, my strength is made perfect, not in strength. My, my strength is made perfect in weakness, that he might make it strength. Glory be to God. And so you call upon his strength. You drink in his strength. You use his strength. And he says, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. And then in uh, Mark chapter 16 again, we're going to wear that one out. You are to take dominion. You are to hold the reins. These signs shall, shall follow them that believe. I'd put a little circle around the word shall and then believe, you know. These signs shall. There's no doubt about it. It shall follow them that believe. Not been a deacon 14 years and a Sunday school teacher 18 years. He's, he's not talking about that. They that believe, they, they that believe, they shall receive, they shall receive this mighty healing power. And so we find all through the words of God that these things are true. In Galatians 3 and 13, on your page 120, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Now, centuries later, in Deuteronomy 28, 59 and 60, all the curses are listed there. And, uh, and, and in that place, Moses said sickness was one of those curses. Now, all those curses lose their power when you become a child of God for the simple reason that Christ has redeemed us from that curse of those things being made a curse for us. So we are bought with a price. Therefore, we glorify God in our bodies and in our spirits, which are God's. It glorifies God for you to have dominion in your spirit and in your body over the devil or over anything that wants to hurt you. Now you say that, but Brother Summerall, if I get sick and I cannot get well, I don't think you ought to be negative about it myself. I think you should start demanding health in Jesus' name and command it to come out with a good, strong, loud voice. Say, come out! Thank you, Lord, I'm well. <laughs> You'd be amazed. You'd just be amazed at how it would change conditions on the inside of you. But if you're going to say, now what can I take next? I'm going to have taken 14 at home. <laughs> God says, oh, well, let him have it, you know. He's helping himself. And, and, but there is a deliverance. And I, we have witnessed it. We have seen it. We believe in it. And we thank God for it. Now, when we talk of these things, we certainly don't mean that on this earth we're going to live forever. Every one of us are going to go home to heaven. And, and, and so when God wants us home to heaven, he's he, he got a good calendar. And he keeps the calendar just right. He knows just when to do it. And my time's coming and your time's coming. We're not talking about that. But until we go home to heaven, we have a right to divine healing. Can you say amen to that? We have a right to divine healing. All right, and you'll be there. We understand the devil has power. Uh, as an archangel and as the prince of the power of the air, he does have power. He had it with Job, and we read in the word of God, to, to bring a disease. And, and, and so as a Christian, it's possible that he does have a power. You possess a divine authorization from Jesus to rebuke, to renounce, and to destroy all that authority that the devil has. Job certainly was not well equipped like you are. We understand that that is the first book written in the Bible. It's not the first one in your Bible, but was written before the five books of Moses, the oldest book in the Bible. And he certainly did not have what we know today uh, to know all the things that God was able to do. You and I are much better equipped uh, to know how to become delivered than he was. But we must exercise 
every right that belongs to us so we won't stay sick or unwell. If necessary, quote the source of your power. Just as a policeman says, in the name of the law, stop. You as Christ's disciples say, in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. And, and uh, it works when you put it in his name. And when God has promised that none of the diseases of the world, of the sinning world, of the ungodly world would come upon his people, they didn't come upon the Israelites. So Jesus came into this world to destroy those works of the devil, the Bible says. So Christians who are not grounded in the word of God, and that's what's wrong in a lot of denominational people, you know. They're not grounded in the word of God and they're not aware of the dominion that belongs to them. And they do not realize that in these strategic areas, if they resist the devil, he has to go. If they resist the devil, he has to go. They do not know that they have authority to resist the devil and the works of, the, of Lucifer. And so they put up with them. And, and they shouldn't. They absolutely should not do it. Now, uh, why does a Christian get sick? Uh, there are a lot of reasons. I went to Paris, France to preach right after World War II. I got right in there before they cleaned it up, uh, before they, the, big, the buildings were, uh, that were knocked down were taken away. And I was preaching. And they didn't have much food in, in France. E even, even eggs, uh, you only got, say, one a week or two a week at the most. And you, you had to have a government coupon even to get those. And I ate bread that must have had uh, more sawdust in it than it had wheat uh, because I got desperately ill, desperately ill. Now, you couldn't blame that on God and neither could you blame it on me. I was hungry and I ate the bread. But I became desperately ill. Now, that church had about 1,500 people in it. I sat in a corner all day because I didn't have a private room. The, 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 the pastor was, didn't have a big place. Most people in Europe don't have a big place. And uh, I sat in a corner uh, with a blanket over the top of me, covering me everywhere. I sat in the middle of the blanket and it drooped all over me in a chair in a corner, praying. And went in and out to the bathroom. It was close by. And, and uh, I was a sick person, a raging fever. And it became church time and the pastor knew I was sick. He said, you're not going to church, are you? Well, I said, yes, I'm going to go preach tonight. He couldn't believe it, you know, sitting there with a raging fever. And I had a fever inside and shaking with cold outside. And, and so I said, yes, I'm going to go to the church. And, and he took me to church, but I couldn't see. I'd gone blind with this fever. And I told him, I said, no, I can't see very well. You, you'll have to help me. So he sat me down. It came time to preach. I said, I'd take me to the pulpit. Well, I, I couldn't read uh, the Bible because I couldn't see. But I said, man, I, I can give my testimony. And I said, this would be a good place to give it. And I began to testify how Jesus had healed me. And I began to testify of all the others that I had known to be healed. And the scriptures began to roll out of my heart and I began to testify of them. And I, I, I went on for 40 or 50 minutes preaching there, felt, feeling better all along. And then I... I, I, I reached back and sat down in the chair and I thought the pastor would dismiss the meeting. I thought he knew enough to do that, but he didn't. He got carried away with what I was saying. <laughs> he said, this is the most wonderful testimony we've ever heard. Our brother Sumrall wants to pray for all of you people. <laughs> I was hurting all over and I was in a burning up fever. But I'm a strange person. If you say do it, I'll do it, you know? So I said, lead me down there. And he led me down there, and I can't tell you what happened to the first person, but I can tell you what happened to Lester Sumrall. When I laid my hands on the first person, the power of God struck me. That fever was gone that instant. That terrible feeling in my middle was gone. I was healed by the power of God. I prayed for four or five or six or seven hundred people there, one right after the other. When I got through, I said, now I'm ready to preach. Glory be to God. Yeah. You say, what, what brought that healing? I, I believe faithfulness brought it. I could have gone back into that corner and sat there all night and shook, you know. The Lord said, well, you didn't have to shake. You just shake your bones because you want to shake. You see, but my faithfulness to God in believing and healing in spite of my own illness, you see. And then my willingness to bless others when I needed to help myself and as I poured my spirit out to others, the miracle of God moved through that place and those French people won't ever forget that night. God was there. He was there to heal. Can you say amen? Amen. All right, number C. 
on page 120. There are times that God does not see fit to heal a person, even when he's a child, uh, a child of God, that fulfill all of his conditions for existing dominion. It is a mystery held within the God's sovereign hands. Satan uses such things to tempt us to, to doubt God, but we know that God must have a higher plan. When you can't understand a situation, God does. There are no mysteries with God. Do you believe it? Amen. God chooses to glorify himself through the grace and the peace he gives his children. Sometimes this grace is made most impressive through a suffering sight. I have seen many of God's children walk through this life such as, in such an afflicted manner. And even in their weak condition, they were not miserable like sinners are. They have a victorious faith and they have a strange dominion over conditions around about them and they know that they are free by God's mighty power. Now, it would take a long time to anybody to go through and say, of every situation, why are Christians sick? I want to say this, they're the wellest people in the world. If you want to see sick people, go to a heathen country where they're almost all sick. And, and you'll see they are the wellest people in the world. It might be you have overeaten, it might be you have uh, uh, overexercised, uh, and there might be that you've come in contact with some contamination. I don't know. There are many things that can cause your sickness. But there's one thing that can make you well. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, can flow through you and make you well by His mighty power. We've experienced it and we believe it.